What's going on guys? Welcome in. My name is Dr. Jim Cellini and I'm a board certified practicing veterinary neurologist and neurosurgeon. If you've seen any of my content at all, you've probably gathered that I'm really down on brachycephaly and the further creation of brachycephalic animals in general. My overall stance is that the creation of and the normalization in society of brachycephaly is probably the worst thing that we've ever done to companion animals in terms of their overall health. The reason I have this stance is not because of some hatred towards those pets. The exact opposite happens to be true. I love those dogs on an individual basis. And in fact, I've committed my entire life to trying to help them as best I can in my own way. The reason I don't like that confirmation so much is simply because of the evidence that shows that it imparts significant morbidity and mortality to these poor animals, dogs and cats alike. Now, obviously not everybody agrees with me and the people that tend to disagree with my stance typically are involved with the breeding of these animals or in some way just fans of how they look and want to preserve the shape that we've imparted onto them. And even though I've never personally met a fellow veterinarian who disagrees with my stance, there are vets out there who feel like brachycephaly is either a neutral or even a good thing in some aspects. I recently came across a podcast entitled Pure Dog Talk, and this is hosted by Laura Reeves. She is a breeder and pure dog enthusiast from what I can gather. But on a recent episode, she interviewed a veterinarian named Dr. Marianne Mack, who actually has a stance that is pretty much the opposite of mine. And since I've never come across a veterinarian before who has this stance, I wanted to listen to it, react to it, and provide a little bit of some counter arguments to what she says in this podcast. So that's what I'm going to spend this episode doing today. Um, I'm going to react to the podcast. I'm going to play snippets of the podcast in a way that I can't play the entire thing. It's 38 minutes and there's ads and um, other things that aren't really relevant to this conversation in there. But I am going to try to present the podcast in the meat of the argument in as accurate a way as I can. Um, so I don't want to like misrepresent their argument or anything like that. This is not an attempt at some sort of like sensationalist journalism or something. I just want to present their argument, Dr. Mack's argument, and then I'm going to present a counter argument and provide some research that backs my argument up. So without further ado, guys, let's get into the podcast. Welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and I've got a really important topic for us today, you guys. Very recently, with the Norwegian Kennel Club losing a lawsuit, a legal filing that makes the breeding of Cavalier King Charles Spaniels and Bulldogs illegal unless they're crossbred. And this impacts all of us. I know you might not think it does, but it does. And our guest today is Dr. Marianne Mack. She is a veterinarian. She is a breeder of Boston Terriers and Pug Dogs. And she's got some very interesting insight on this. So I'm excited and I'm super excited to have Marianne here with us. So welcome, Marianne. Thank you. So whenever two people are presenting arguments, it's always important to identify bias between both of those sides, right? So I think we can identify that Dr. Mack's bias in her argument is the fact that she breeds brachycephalic dogs, she owns them, and I, you know, I can't speak to like her finances or anything like that, but she may have like a financial conflict of interest in, you know, because she produces and sells brachycephalic animals. So I, I'm not saying that's like, you know, completely obliterates her argument. I just think we need to identify that as an underlying bias that she has. My own underlying bias is perhaps clouded by the fact that I see very sick brachycephalic dogs for all sorts of problems, and I see my colleagues working with them too. Um, and so I may be a little bit biased in seeing these animals and seeing only the sick ones, kind of like a selection bias in that way. So I think before we get into the meat of the argument, it's important to lay out the two biases that exist between us. So between that time mark and about the five minute mark of the podcast, Dr. Mack goes through her background in pet ownership, how she owns multiple pugs and Boston Terriers. She breeds these dogs and she also owns brachycephalic cats. And then she talks about how she got into veterinary school to help people and their bond and also to help create healthier animals. And it seems like a very hard way to accomplish an increase in overall health is by making brachycephalic animals. So um, let's keep going with the podcast and see how she explains that. Just simply being brachycephalic does not make them unhealthy. Exactly. So right off the bat, I'm seeing a couple flaws here. One is they're using terms like unhealthy and healthy in very broad strokes, and they're not getting to very specific details about what exactly disease we're talking about here. Two is they're making a straw man argument to make it sound as if my claim or people that think like me, our claim is that being brachycephalic automatically means X, Y, and Z diseases happen every single time, 100% guaranteed. 
That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is what the data tells us, which I'll show you in a second as we get through the podcast, is that being brachycephalic creates increased risk and substantial morbidity as well as mortality. It doesn't guarantee anything, and I'm not making that claim. So I think that the fact that a lot of these groups have started to associate having a short face with being unhealthy is a really slippery slope that we don't want to go down. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of components of brachycephalic airway syndrome. So those are stenotic nares or really tight nostrils, Mm -hmm. an elongated soft palate, and a hypoplastic trachea. Those are sort of the three main issues that you see with brachycephalic airway syndrome. And then those things lead to other problems like the laryngeal saccules come out and you have a lot of swelling in your larynx and you can have tracheal collapse. So those are all progressive issues, but we don't have any studies showing those are directly related to the length of the nose. And that's what I was really super excited to have you talk about is what you have information wise as a veterinarian that you can offer our listeners to talk about what we actually know about brachycephalic breeds and that it's the width of the skull in comparison to the length of the muzzle, not just the length of the muzzle, all of those sorts of things. And talking about specifics about brachycephalic, a short nose does not mean you are automatically unhealthy. All right, now let me present a couple of counter arguments. One, just starting off, the condition is called brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. We see this condition almost entirely in brachycephalic animals. The whole problem is named brachycephalic syndrome, right? It's a brachycephalic dog thing. And what makes a dog brachycephalic is a flat face. So right off the bat, this argument doesn't really make much sense to me, but let's delve into the actual research. To start with, you can go to the American College of Veterinary Surgeons website and look at a summary of the condition brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. In the very first paragraph in the overview part of this website, common examples include, you know, they list a bunch of breeds, These dogs have been bred to have relatively short muzzles and noses, and because of this, the throat and breathing passages in these dogs are frequently undersized or flattened. Now, that seems pretty cut and dry to me, but I know these days our institutions aren't what they used to be. No politics on this channel, but let's get into some actual research so I can illustrate this even further. A 2016 paper out of the Royal College of Veterinary Medicine in the UK looked at whether or not the facial conformation of dogs impacted the risk of brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. What they showed was that the relative risk of developing this obstructive airway syndrome increases sharply and non-linearly as the muzzle length decreases in a dog. This graph illustrates nicely how the cranial facial ratio as they measured in the study, which is essentially the length of the muzzle, as the length of the muzzle shortens, you can see how the risk and probability of developing obstructive airway syndrome sharply goes up towards one, meaning like 100% chance. So to say that there's no evidence that the length of the muzzle or length of the nose has anything to do with this condition is entirely false. The components that we really have to look for that we know make the biggest difference in these dogs is the elongated soft palate, Yeah, which is probably the biggest one. So if you don't know, the soft palate, and I'll illustrate it here, is basically the soft tissue that's in the very back of your throat. And normally, it's supposed to be there and not cover up your airway. In brachycephalic dogs, it very often is elongated and overhangs the airway and covers up the opening of the airway called the larynx. So we call this an elongated soft palate. But again, to say that the muzzle length has nothing to do with this is just simply not true from the evidence that we know. The soft tissues inside the upper respiratory tract simply do not scale down in proportion to a decrease in muzzle length. You have a nasal passage that doesn't grow as the dog ages, but you have soft tissues that do grow as the dog ages. You can see with the mismatch there, the soft tissues have to go somewhere and they end up covering up where air should normally flow. I've even run into that with pugs, so yeah. And in combination with that, you can get a thick tongue, Mm -hmm. so a bigger tongue than most dogs would have, and basically just a smaller airway. Mm -hmm. And that's not related to how long your nose is. Now, she is probably right. The size of a dog's tongue may not have much to do with their muzzle length directly. I don't think there's any evidence to demonstrate that. But we do know that brachycephalic dogs have histopathologic changes in their tongue that makes it larger, and this is different from dogs that aren't brachycephalic. So... I don't know if you can correlate it to muzzle length, but being brachycephalic does impart yet again this type of a risk. 
So the University of Cambridge has a whole brachycephalic. That BOA study, right? Yeah. Yes. Very and I think cool. that's something that we really should look into doing here, where these dogs, there's two different parts of the study. So the first one, they're put in a chamber that measures them and how much air they're bringing in, how hard they're working to breathe. It sort of measures all the pressure, the oxygen, the carbon cool. dioxide levels, and gives us a good information about this dog at rest and how they're moving air. But please also take note that the respiratory flow characteristics are significantly different between brachycephalic and non-brachycephalic breeds as listed in the report right there. Most brachycephalic breeds, with the exception of some of the more mastiff type brachycephalic mm -hmm. breeds, mm -hmm. these dogs were bred to be companions and that's their job. And they do that very, very, very well. And part of the reason we love them so much is that these brachycephalic facial features elicit almost an infantile-like response to people, which, I mean, I can't help it. I'm the same way. I see these little faces and you just can't help it. They actually touched on a huge part of the problem here, which is that the appearance of these dogs as their face and as their skull structure changes, they become more human-like in their appearance, even though they're dogs. So from studies on human psychology that people are driven to want dogs and cats and other pets that have more human infantile features, Brachycephalic animals fit this bill. They have very big eyes, bulging eyes, bulging cheeks, and a flatter head that more closely resembles a human face than it does a dog. And if you think that's messed up, well, that's because it is. And I don't believe that it is something that we have to do to have healthy dogs to insist that every dog look the same. Exactly. I see this all the time with my clients. I always want my clients to have a dog that is suitable for their lifestyle. So I see this as another straw man argument. Nobody's saying that we want every dog to look the same. All we are saying is that dogs should have a nose and a muzzle of normal length so that they do not suffer from health problems secondary to a lack of a nose. That's it. And for some people, that might be a German Shepherd. It might be a Labrador. It might be a Border Collie. But for a lot of people, they really need a companion dog that is bred to be a companion. And for those people, a brachycephalic dog is a really good fit. They're not out running and, and doing all kinds of vigorous Okay, activities. now wait a minute. I've had a few pugs that like, <laughs> we're escape artists, so I'm yes. saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and my dogs love to go on hikes. But what I love oh, yeah. about them is that they don't need to. Right. So when I had Australian Shepherds, they needed to do things every day. But with these Bostons and the pugs. If you don't feel well for a week, they're totally happy to just veg on the- So they seem to be trying to make a point here that there's a societal role for brachycephalic dogs in being a lap dog and being a dog that can chill out indoors with you and not need a lot of exercise, which I, that is true. There is a role for that type of companion animal, but that doesn't justify making them brachycephalic. Like you could do that just as easily and not have them be brachycephalic. So yes, they happen to be good dogs, but they're also very unhealthy. So that doesn't justify making them unhealthy in my opinion. Okay, so I think the important part I wanted to bring forward using your absolute specific knowledge, I mean, you bred the number one Boston a couple of years ago, yes? Yes. yes. Okay, so you have in-depth knowledge of breeding and whelping brachycephalic breeds as well as veterinary education. And all of these things tell you the same thing. Brachycephalic is not what is causing your dog to have a problem. So for all the reasons I previously mentioned, I obviously disagree with that. But again, just think about it this way. If being brachycephalic isn't the problem, then why do we see all of these problems in brachycephalic dogs? Okay, so outlawing brachycephalic dogs simply because they happen to have a brachycephalic skull construction seems rather counterproductive. Yes, that's definitely not the direction we need to go. I think we need to focus as preservation breeders on doing a little bit of a better job on selecting breeding stock and producing healthier versions of every breed, honestly, but mm -hmm. for brachycephalic specifically. And we all know that there are some dogs out there that are not good breeders. So I disagree with this premise just in general. I don't think that the preservation of a breed or breed characteristics is really worth doing or prioritizing over the health of the animal. I think the former, the health of the animal, should take precedence above all else and everything else should really be a distant second to that. Particularly this Norwegian decision makes it so the only people that can legally breed these dogs, whether it's Cavaliers or Bulldogs, are the European version of our backyard breeders. People that aren't honor bound to follow a system. Right, and that's a scary thought. <laughs> 
Exactly. So this is a very common reaction that you're hearing from breeders across the world in regards to Norway's recent decision. I don't think this is a great argument for two reasons. One, the breed standards from the Kennel Club and the American Kennel Club, as you see here, both list very extreme features of these different breeds' faces. So if you are adhering to the strictest definition of the Kennel Club breed guidelines, you're going to create this problem. You're creating brachycephaly. The second reason I don't think this argument works very well is because it's basically an argument against all laws in general. You can say that about any law, like, well, if you make it illegal, well, then just people that want to do illegal things are going to do it. So I just don't think that argument really makes sense. All right, guys, so those are some of my thoughts. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Let me know in the comments below what you think. And also, please, if you don't mind hitting that like and subscribe button, that would be great, too. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.